This episode of The History Guy brought to you by World of Warships. Well, the contest between the Royal Navy and the Imperial German Navy, and particularly the new technology of the submarine, tends to dominate any discussion of the naval component of the Great War that was not the only naval contest out there. In the Baltic, the ships of the German High Seas Fleet faced off against the ships of the Imperial Russian Navy, and in August 1915, the High Seas Fleet sought to eliminate the Russian Navy's Baltic Fleet in a little-remembered battle that was far more important than you might have realized. The 1915 Battle of the Gulf of Riga deserves to be remembered. One of the best parts of the free-to-play game World of Warships, available now on PC, is that you get to play actual historic vessels, including some of the gnarly-looking dreadnoughts and protected cruisers of the early 20th century. In fact, you can play ships like the Tier 3 battlecruisers SMS Nassau and Vandertan that participated in the Battle of the Gulf of Riga. Because World of Warships is not just a game, it's a floating digital museum displaying breathtaking recreations of not just the most fearsome vessels of the First and Second World Wars, but also many blueprints and designs of ships that never saw battle. And just like in the Battle of the Gulf of Riga, you can play different classes of ships. Powerful dreadnought battleships, fast protected cruisers, fast attacking destroyers, and sneaky submarines. Since launch, World of Warships has added over 500 playable ships from 10 different nations. Enjoy an active and engaged online community, including me, the History Guy, who share your passion for naval combat of the First and Second World Wars. New content is released every month, and did I mention the game is also available on console? World of Warships is just a heck of a lot of fun to play. It is the perfect balance between action and strategic gameplay, so download now using the link in the description. On registration, new players will get free credits, free doubloons, free premium gameplay, and a free ship after you complete 15 battles. The naval war in the Baltic is not one of the more discussed theaters of the Great War, but it was actually quite an interesting theater, with different challenges than almost any other. After the unification of Germany in 1871, the entire southern coast of the Baltic was German. This made defense of the Baltic and its coastline critical to the empire, as the entire northern border of the German empire was vulnerable to naval bombardment or invasion from the Baltic. But defense of that coastline was even more important because of trade with Sweden. Sweden was neutral, trading with both sides, but the trade with Germany across the Baltic was particularly important, and Sweden was Imperial Germany's largest source of iron ore. The German war industry was entirely dependent upon these imports, without which the Germans would not have been able to prosecute the war effort. If the Allies could effectively blockade Germany in the Baltic, the Empire could not have lasted through 1915. But the Allies proved unable to do that, despite the fact that at the outset of war in 1914, the British Royal Navy included more than three times the total tonnage of the Imperial German Navy. The Allies faced unique challenges in the Baltic due to its geography. While the Baltic Sea is an arm of the Atlantic Ocean, it is essentially an inland sea. An article in the spring 2018 edition of the Naval War College Review notes that, in terms of operating environment, the Baltic Sea is challenging for maritime forces. Much of it is shallow in depth, and access to the region is controlled by narrow inlets, such as the Danish Straits. Between 1887 and 1895, the Germans had built a canal through the German state of Schleswig-Holstein that connected the North Sea to the Baltic, and between 1907 and 1914 had widened and deepened the canal to make it large enough for dreadnoughts, the largest warships of the day, to pass through. This meant that Germany controlled a passage that allowed ships of its high seas fleet in the North Sea to quickly move to the Baltic Sea. The only path for the Royal Navy, however, was through the straits around Denmark. Like Sweden, Denmark remained neutral throughout the war. As a neutral state, the rules of war said that they had to leave their waters open for navigation. But they weren't. They were mined. This was because Germany demanded that Denmark mine the straits, specifically to prevent the Royal Navy from blockading Germany in the Baltic. Denmark mined the straits themselves, afraid that if they did not, Germany would use the mining of the straits as an excuse to invade. The United Kingdom wanted to support Danish neutrality, and so tacitly allowed the straits to be mined. This meant that the British Grand Fleet was largely cut off from the Baltic. Thus, the Imperial Navy was able to dominate the Baltic, but at a cost, since sending ships to the Baltic meant taking them away from the North Sea. But the admirals of the German High Seas Fleet generally saw countering the British Grand Fleet in the North Sea to be the priority. 
In his 1937 Naval History of the Great War, Bernard Halperin writes, The inherent mobility of sea power enabled the Germans to establish unchallenged superiority in the Baltic any time they cared to detach sufficient forces from the North Sea to do so. It isn't that the Royal Navy was cut off from the Baltic Sea entirely. While it would have been a great risk to try to send surface ships through the Denmark Straits, submarines could slip through. While the submarine war is usually seen through the lens of the German U-boats in the Battle of the Atlantic, the Baltic was another story. Al Kation, a website for educators, explains, During World War I, while the U-boats of the Imperial German Navy prowled the North Atlantic in an effort to blockade imports distant for Britain, British submarines, on a smaller scale, sowed fear in the Baltic Sea and interrupted surface vessel traffic there. But there was another naval force to contend with in the Baltic. Aside from the southern coast, controlled by Germany and Sweden to the north, the Baltic was Russian. Prior to 1917, what today we think of as the Baltic states of Lithuania and Latvia were part of the Russian Empire. Finland was a grand duchy that, although technically part of the empire, retained a significant degree of autonomy, including exclusion from the draft. While Finland essentially operated as a neutral country, Russian forces, particularly naval forces, still had use of the territory. Perhaps most importantly to Russia, the Russian capital of Petrograd was on the Gulf of Finland. Like Imperial Germany, defending the Baltic coast meant for Russia defense of the homeland. Halperin explains, the Russians were a land power of great importance in the European balance of power. Their strength at sea was nowhere near their strength on land, but their potential was significant. The Imperial Russian Navy had been devastated during the 1904-05 Russo-Japanese War, falling from the third largest navy in the world to the sixth largest. Reconstruction had been difficult, and Imperial Russia faced a particular naval challenge. The fleet had to be divided between the Baltic, the Black Sea, and the Pacific, three areas so separated that mutual support was impossible. While Halperin notes that they could realistically hope to dominate the Black Sea, they had little hope of matching the German fleet ship for ship in the Baltic. Thus, he argues, the big question was how much of the German fleet they might divert to the Baltic from its position facing the British in the North Sea. The Imperial Russian Navy in the Baltic was substantial, including five pre-dreadnought battleships, with three newer dreadnought battleships under construction, as well as 10 cruisers, 21 destroyers, and 48 torpedo boats. The Russian Navy faced, however, many challenges, including logistics, but Halperin notes the most difficult challenge was with personnel. Foreign observers were frequently critical of the attitude of the Russian Naval Officer Corps, although the Corps must have faced special difficulties turning generally illiterate inland conscripts into seamen particularly with the long northern winters, hampering training. Thus, the naval contest in the Baltic became a strategy of defense. Both sides depended upon large minefields and coastal fortifications, the Germans to discourage any offensive action by the Russian fleet, and the Russians to protect the gulfs of Finland and Riga from attack by the Germans. The Germans could choose to create a dominant naval force in the Baltic at any time, but only by weakening their fleet in the North Sea. Actions tended to center around small ships, while Alcation notes the mighty capital ship sat like chess pieces. Each side struck blows occasionally, but the fleets largely stayed away from each other. But the naval war in the Baltic saw a change in the summer of 1915. While the Great War in the West took place largely in France and Belgium, the Eastern Front stretched some 800 miles from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea. Halperin notes that the First World War on the Eastern Front was far different than the picture most people have derived from the more familiar fighting in the West. Rather than the static war in the West, the war in the East was largely fought over huge expanses of open ground and was much more fluid. Russia had found some initial success in a massive invasion of East Prussia in August of 1914, an attack they had promised their French allies in order to draw German troops away from the West, but attacks by the Central Powers had thrown the Russians on the defensive in 1915, leading to what was called the Russian Great Retreat. Halperin describes the situation of the ground war in the Baltic. Courland in the Baltic represented the extreme left flank of the German line. The area consisted to a large extent of barren wastes, and when the German offensive began in April, the front lines were made up of block posts at 10-mile intervals. Roads and communications were poor, and the Germans had few troops to spare for the area. The German forces represented approximately 5.5 infantry and 7.5 cavalry divisions. The Russians retreated steadily under German pressure. The Germans occupied Vindau in Latvia on 18 July, and the advance did not stop until the Russians established a strong line before Riga. 
suddenly a land battle that was on the fringe of the front, where the largest battles were being fought far to the south, was threatening Riga. Today, the capital of Latvia, in 1915, Riga was an important industrial port city of the Russian Empire. Moreover, the line along the Daugava River south of Riga represented the end of the Great Retreat. If the German army broke the line, the road to Moscow would be left open, and Imperial Russia might be knocked out of the war. Halpern writes that the Gulf of Riga was steadily becoming a focal point of naval activity as the German army advanced in Courland, and naval operations on the flanks of the army grew in importance. The defense of Riga thus largely hinged on Russian naval control of the Gulf of Riga, which allowed Russian ships to threaten the German flank and to prevent the Germans from landing troops. Protected by mines and coastal defenses, the Russian Baltic fleet in the Gulf of Riga, including four gunboats, Sioux Shallow Draft, facilitated support of the seaward flank of the army, a mine layer, six submarines, 25 destroyers and torpedo boats, a seaplane carrier with four aircraft, and the old pre-dreadnought battleship Slava had significant advantages. Halperin writes, The Germans might have control in the Baltic, but the Russian Navy could have claimed control of the Gulf of Riga. The Germans found it difficult to bring their superior force to bear there, and the Russians proved to be difficult to dislodge. Thus, in early August 1915, the Germans sent a significant group with the high seas fleet into the Baltic, with the goal of destroying the Russian naval presence in the Gulf of Riga, and potentially drawing what was left of the Russian fleet into the Baltic from the Gulf of Finland. If they could defeat the Russian navy in support of their land campaign, Germany might be able to knock Russia out of the war. The German fleet, under the command of Admiral Franz von Hipper, included eight dreadnoughts, three battle cruisers, five light cruisers, and 31 destroyers. The Battle of the Gulf of Riga began on August 8th. While much of the German fleet would stay in the Baltic to defend against any attack by the rest of the Russian fleet, two pre-dreadnought battleships would support a group of minesweepers who were to open the channel into the Gulf. This would allow the German battleships and battle cruisers to enter the Gulf and destroy the Russian vessels there as well as to mine the Strait of Moon Sound, preventing reinforcements from coming from the Gulf of Finland. But the attack didn't go as planned. The Russians, including the 12-inch guns of the Slava, harassed the minesweepers. The German battleships drove the Slava back, but continued attacks from smaller craft, and aircraft continued. The resistance meant that the minesweeping took more time than intended, and it became clear that the Germans would not be able to enter the Gulf before nightfall. As it was to be a moonless night, it was clear that the Deutschland, the mine layer intended to mine the moon sound, would not be able to proceed at night. The delay meant that the German attack couldn't proceed. Vice Admiral Erhard Schmidt, in charge of the attack, was in a difficult position. Many of his smaller torpedo craft were low on coal and would have to withdraw, leaving his ships vulnerable to attack from submarines. The mines, determined resistance of the greatly outnumbered Russian fleet and threat of submarines, had defeated the superior German force which was forced to withdraw. Schmidt tried again on the 18th, this time with the support of the newer dreadnoughts SMS Possen and Nassau, which had much better underwater protection in case of attack by mines or submarines. On this attack, Schmidt planned much more time for minesweeping. Again, the Russians put up a stout defense, and a German minesweeper and destroyer were lost in the first day. Schmidt sent two destroyers in the Gulf to attempt a night attack on Slava, but they were unable to reach the battleship, and instead, they found themselves in a clash with Russian destroyers and one of the German destroyers was set on fire and then struck a mine and sank as it attempted to retreat. A duel the next day between Possen and Nassau and the Slava resulted in three hits on the Russian battleship, forcing it to withdraw. The Germans managed to breach the minefield, but another destroyer was lost when it struck a mine. Once in the Gulf, Schmidt became concerned about the threat from submarines and acutely aware that his larger vessels had little ability to maneuver in the Gulf. He was also aware that he had lost the advantage of surprise, and that mining Moon Sound would only delay any Russian force coming from the Gulf of Finland. The moment had passed, and he decided to retreat. In the Baltic, the British submarine E-1 struck the battlecruiser Moltke with a torpedo. The Moltke benefited from a stroke of good luck, as the torpedo entered Moltke's bow torpedo room, but none of Moltke's torpedoes detonated. The British at first reported the Moltke sunk, although the ship survived and was repaired. Having taken several losses and under the threat of submarines, Hipper decided to withdraw back to the North Sea. The Battle of the Gulf of Riga included a few long-range duels between battleships, some hot destroyer actions, and the ever-present threat of mines and submarines. The combination of the geography of the Baltic Sea and Gulf of Riga, and a determined resistance by an outnumbered Russian fleet, outlasted a substantially larger German fleet that was unwilling to sustain major losses. 
The Germans claimed victory, having proven their ability to penetrate the Russian defenses, but the Allies claimed that they had won a significant naval battle, sinking several German ships for light losses of their own. The little-remembered 1915 naval battle of the Gulf of Riga wasn't a large naval battle. No capital ships were sunk, and yet it was significant. Had the Germans defeated the Russian Navy and taken control of the Gulf of Riga, then the Russian army's position south of Riga would have been untenable. They would have been flanked. But with the withdrawal of the German fleet, the Germans lost their chance of taking Riga by land. When German troops tried to land by barge on August 20th, they were driven off by Russian gunboats. Riga wouldn't fall for another two years. And when it finally did, in the September 1917 Battle of Riga, it represented the near-final collapse of the Russian army. The road left open to Moscow, it helped to spur the October Revolution, which raises an interesting question. If the Russian Navy had not held off in the 1915 Battle of Riga, then might the German army have broken the Russian army and forced Russia out of the war two years earlier? And if that had happened, might that have changed? the outcome of the war. Remember, download World of Warships using the link in the description. Use the promo code WARSHIPS to get free to blues, credits, premium playtime, and a free ship after you complete 15 battles. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guy. And if you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guy with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guy as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community and locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop for book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo.